World War II was one of the grimmest and most terrible moments in humanity's long history. And while the villains of that story lost the war, the other possibility of that is now a favorite topic among authors, storytellers, and ponderers. Among the great what-ifs of history, the most chilling is the possibility that the Nazis might have won. This is the premise behind Robert Harris's novel, Fatherland. Philip K. Dick's The Man in the High Castle, now an Amazon TV series, and Lynn Dayton's SSGB, which has been adapted by the BBC and is airing on Sunday nights. But while all three are set shortly after the war, when the scars of the conflict are still vividly raw, few writers have ever wondered what the world would look like today if the Nazis had won. Let's talk about this. For the sake of this imaginary world, let's create a scenario wherein the Nazis won and now they control the world. Let's examine how history would look like right to this very day. Imagine this. The Germans would have been victorious at Stalingrad, smashing the Red Army and opening the way to the oil fields. This gave them the momentum to fight off the British and American landings at D-Day, which turned into a disaster for the Allies. They completed the conquest of European Russia a year later, and the German invasion force landed in Britain in the late summer of 1946. By March 1947, London was taken and Prime Minister Winston Churchill was dead. About seven decades on, the events of that bitter winter of 1947 seemed like ancient history. The Greater German Reich now completely dominates continental Europe, which is known as the New Order. Indeed, when schoolchildren from all over the Reich make the required visits to the spots where Churchill died, or, as the guides put it, the greatest war criminal in history met his end, you can see them stifling yawns of boredom. Yet, no one doubts that tomorrow's VE Day celebrations will be a big deal. After all, the youthful chancellor of the Greater German Reich, Frock Petri, the first woman to wield supreme power in Europe, is flying in specially. According to sources at the Ministry of Public Enlightenment, she is expected to read from Hitler's speech announcing the end of the war in Europe and to lay a wreath at the vast statue of Edward VIII. He returned to claim the throne following his abdication in 1936, at the end of the conflict and ruled until his death in 1972. Little wonder that party officials are expecting at least a million people on the streets of London. Thank goodness then for our famously efficient train network, which should easily cope with the extra demand. Yet, despite the sense of occasion, the crowds in the beer halls, the children with their swastika-themed balloons, the ubiquitous posters showing the famous image of the two Wehrmacht soldiers raising the Nazi banner over the ruins of Buckingham Palace, these are troubled times. The European economy has never truly recovered from the financial crash of 2007-8, when the collapse of the giant Credenstalt Bank in Vienna sent shockwaves through the banking system. Indeed, thousands of German troops are still fighting nationalist partisans in Greece, which bore the brunt of the consequent austerity that had been engulfed in a bloody war ever since. An even greater shadow, however, is that of terrorism. Despite the efforts of our friends and allies in the Middle East, including the Greater Arab Republic's veteran president Saddam Hussein, Islamist extremism, Islamist extremism remains a genuine threat to the fatherland and its neighbors. Only last week, Chancellor Petri told the Reichstag that enemy funding for Islamist terrorism has reached unprecedented levels. Of course, most of the money is coming from Washington, D.C., where the president of the world's most infamous rogue state, Hillary Clinton, won power last November on a platform of no compromise with national socialism. The U.S. has been an isolated pariah since conceding defeat in 1955, when the Germans dropped atomic bombs on St. Louis and Philadelphia, but were too exhausted by war to mount a full-scale occupation. At home, too, the mood is much less comfortable than the party likes to pretend. Some commentators blame the development of the internet, which owes much to the efforts of SS research scientists in the so-called Silicon Valleys and the Mosul and the Rhine. To the consternation of many public officials, the new age of social media has seen an upsurge in dissent, particularly among the young. Some newspaper columnists talk of a liberal movement sweeping Europe, marked by an upsurge in demagogic liberalism that could, according to Chancellor Petri, endanger all the social and economic progress the fatherland and its allies have made since the dark days of the war.
In some quarters, it has even become fashionable to be nostalgic for the early days of the occupation in the 50s when, as Petria proved historians argue, times were hard, but there was a genuine sense of community. It was a time of tough but necessary decisions, says one Oxford historian. The war in the East was still going on. There were bombs in America. There was still some resistance here in Britain, and of course, the camps were still very busy in those days. His voice trails off and there was an awkward pause, but it was also, he adds, an age when society was becoming safer and cleaner. Indeed, by the early 60s, living standards were rising. The first pop groups were arriving from Hamburg, and many middle-class families were taking their first package holidays to the Baltic and to the Black Forest. Things might, of course, have been different, but for decades it was forbidden to suggest that if things had worked out otherwise, the Allies might even conceivably have won World War II. During the 60s and 70s, dissentants sometimes exchanged underground books, such as Philip K. Dick's fantasy, The Man in the High Castle, which imagines that Britain and the US actually won in 1945, or the novels by Lynn Dayton, who portrays a Britain that the Germans never invaded. To be caught with such a book, however, meant imprisonment, or worse. Today, the mood is more relaxed. The breakthrough came in the 90s, when Robert Harris published his best-selling novel Fatherland, set in an imaginary German some years after the Allied victory. As every schoolchild knows, though, the real story was very different. History is compulsory until the age of 16, and everyone studies three core elements, the making of a Germanic nation, England 410 to 1066, Britain and Germany in the age of Bismarck, and Churchill, the Jews and the road to war. Television, meanwhile, cannot get enough of World War II, though documentaries tend to cover the same topics again and again. The German victory at Stalingrad, the Allied defeat on D-Day, the execution of Stalin, and the fall of London. For all the fashionable nostalgia, though, no one denies that those were hard years. Though most ordinary people, like their counterparts in continental Europe, grudgingly collaborated with their new masters, or liberators as the invaders called themselves, resistance continued for more than a decade. Only in the mid-60s did the German army, working closely with the SS British Free Corps, never short of recruits, incidentally managed to flush out the last armed cells in the mountains of the Midwells, the Western Isles, and the Lake District. But by then, most ordinary people have accustomed themselves to the National Socialist regime, established under Edward VIII and his fascist Prime Minister Sir Oswald Mosley, later Duke of London. By this time, the wider war was over. German rule over Europe, North America, and the Middle East was secure, while the conflict in the East had dwindled to a guerrilla campaign in the foothills of the Urals. With the U.S. surrender, German supremacy was complete. Hitler died in 1958 and was seceded after a brief power struggle by the SS hardliner Reinhard Heydrich, who had narrowly survived an assassination attempt by Czech partisans in 1942. Heydrich lasted 10 turbulent years until he was deposed in a palace coup, but since then, the transfer of power has been relatively smooth. In the meantime, the map of Europe has been remarkably stable. The Greater German Reich, incorporating much of what were once Belgium, Holland, Luxembourg, Austria, Switzerland, Czechoslovakia, Poland, the Baltic States, and European Russia, stretches from the English Channel to the Urals. The Mediterranean and the Axis-dominated lake, while there is no more reliable German ally than the fascist state of France, ruled since 1985 by Jean-Marie Le Pen and his daughter Marine. As for Britain, which has retained a vague pretense of democracy under the Nazi ages, there is no doubt that things have changed enormously since occupation. Economic recovery in the 60s gave way to nationalist agitation a decade later. Even now, politicians shudder to recall the wave of demonstrations that cultivated in the notorious winter of discontent, when Berlin was forced to send in thousands of armed reinforcements to restore order. After the death of the aging autocratic Mosley in 1980, however, the situation began to improve. Most German units were pulled out a few years later. The British Union of Fascists was rebranded as the National Party. Other right-wing groups were allowed to compete in local elections, and there was even talk of a new age of often hate, openness, 
Tragically, however, there were those who sought to exploit the new atmosphere for their own ends. When student protests broke out in London in 1989, the inevitable crackdown culminated in the massacre of Trafalgar Square, when hundreds were reportedly killed by the SS. Today, despite the more liberal climate, talking openly about Trafalgar Square risks a visit from the secret state police, the equivalent of the Gestapo. Yet, if you search on the internet, you can easily find the famous photograph of a lone protester facing a German tank, which has become an icon for what remains of British's resistance movement. A giant version of that image reportedly hangs in the New York Times Square, symbolizing many American sympathies with what they see as a crushed and downtrodden Britain. But no one here has ever seen it, since travel across the Atlantic is strictly forbidden. 70 years after the end of the war, then is Nazism entirely secure? The honest answer is that no one really knows. Most people in Britain have never known anything else. Almost all grew up under the new order. They have all absorbed its key principles, the importance of a leader and the party, the necessity for racial health and integrity, the unique role of the Germanic people, the inferiority of Africans and Asians, the historic villainy of the Jews. Few of us feel proud to be British after decades of Nazi education. We are only too aware of our nation's crimes in the 20th century. Even in small things, we are all Nazis now. We drink German wines, drive German cars, and eat German food. Our children study the great works of Golf and Hitler. Our best footballers aspire to play for German teams. We even prefer German comedies to our own. And the last night of the proms always ends with Wagner. But all is not quite as it seems. And tomorrow, when the crowds line the streets of London for the military parade, many people will know deep down that there is something missing. Or, to put it more accurately, someone. Even now, there are places in Britain where you just can't go. Some are deserted ruins, hidden behind lines of rusting barbed wire. Others are still heavily guarded, though you can sometimes see thin, ghostly shapes moving behind the watchtowers. The government claims that ours is a better world. No one is mad or disabled. There are no gypsies, no homosexuals, no subversives, and no Jews. Sometimes when you walk down the street, you can see the empty houses, uninhabited for decades. Perhaps when you're out shopping, you walk past space where there once was a synagogue. Or an elderly relative mentions a half-forgotten playmate and then falls abruptly silent. Or maybe you pick up a book in a secondhand shop and notice an unfamiliar name, the kind of name you never hear these days, scribbled on the first page. There were people here once, not just in Britain, but across Europe, millions of them, talking and working, laughing and playing with the rest of us. But they are all gone now. Where they stood, there was just a black hole. We never talk about them, but we all know deep down who they were and where they went. Now, is this a world you can imagine living in?